You might not know how lucky you are, but you're about to have a lot of fun with rhetoric. Hey, welcome back. No, don't adjust your TV sets. We have done this one before, but it was also like the second or third time that I'd ever edited a video in my life. So I want to do it again because there was some good information in it that's maybe a little buried under some bad audio and other bad things. And if you've been around the channel for any amount of time, you've probably noticed that rhetoric is a concept that comes up from time to time, mostly because I think a good understanding of rhetoric is a critical foundation to improve your skills as a writer. That's because for thousands of years, rhetoricians have been studying and talking about how to use language effectively, whether that's to give good speeches, emulate the best qualities of literature, or influence social movements, political discussions, and business activities, just to name a few. Rhetoric has such a long and complex history that it can be difficult to define, and we've talked about those many definitions before. I think you'll get a different definition from every person that you ask. But just because rhetoric is difficult to define, that doesn't mean it's hard to understand. Even though every scholar will have their own definition, they all agree that they're talking about basically the same thing. So the goal of this video is not just to give you a definition of rhetoric, but to help you develop a deeper, more intuitive understanding of rhetoric and how it works. That way you'll be better equipped to recognize and use it instead of just knowing about it. To get us started, I think the easiest way to understand rhetoric is to think of it as a tool for getting people on the same page. Politicians use rhetoric to get voters on the same page about voting them into office. Attorneys use rhetoric to get jurors on the same page about declaring their clients not guilty. And speakers at weddings will get the other attendees on the same page to agree that the newlyweds are wonderful, spectacular people who deserve to be celebrated. And maybe even you have wanted to get your friends on the same page so that you all go out for pizza instead of burgers. Perhaps without even knowing it, you've done rhetorical things in order to get people on the same page. Which leads to this basic point. All situations in which rhetoric occurs have these two things in common. First, the potential for people to be on different pages. And second, the need to adapt your strategy for getting people on the same page to the situation that you're in. So that means that rhetoric just doesn't work when everybody is already on the same page. Nobody's going to pick a fight with you if you say the sky is blue, and you're not going to have to make a very convincing case that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. Where everyone already agrees about something, there's no need to get them onto the same page. Instead, rhetoric is useful and necessary where there are multiple valid points of view or opinions. And of course, I don't just mean valid in your own view. People who disagree with you can have valid reasons for believing what they believe. For example, if you think it's worth paying your power company a little extra each month to increase the percentage of renewable energy that they're supplying you with, but then you live with somebody who would rather save that money and donate it for medical research, rhetoric is a tool that can help you to get on the same page, whether that means either one of you changing your mind completely or finding some kind of compromise in the middle. In that case, both of you have reasonable and valid motives, but they're in conflict, so you need to use rhetoric as a tool to bridge that difference. In a similar way, rhetoric isn't happening where there isn't really a choice. Stop signs, for example, are not designed to be persuasive or to change anyone's mind. Instead, the law compels people to stop. And of course, you don't have to stop, but that would be a crime, not a difference of opinion. And in some situations, choice is nullified because of things that are beyond our ability to control. For example, you might be able to convince me to eat seafood, but you could never give a speech or write a paper that would convince me to like it. It's not something that I chose or have the ability to change, so rhetoric isn't going to help us here. But to our second point, you're also not doing rhetoric if you just take a one-size-fits-all approach to every situation that you're in. That is, you're not going to get everybody on the same page if all you ever do is just present data or formal logical proofs for your position. So rhetoric is useful because it helps us to find solutions to the problems that arise when we have groups of people with different ideas and opinions. And I should point out too that it's not just that rhetoric is a good tool for that job, it's also often the best and only tool. But that's enough conceptual talk. Let's take a look at rhetoric in action in order to get a better feel for how it works in practice. Imagine that you're a superhero patrolling your beloved but crime-riddled city when you and your trusty sidekick hear a blood-curdling call for help. When you arrive on the scene, you see a massive truck trundling into town with a bomb large enough to rip a hole in space-time. 
Of course, there's only one villain villainous enough to do something like this, your arch nemesis. His private sky fortress materializes in the air above you and beams you up into a cunningly crafted force field prison from which there can be no escape. Suspended in the air above your fair city, you can only listen as your arch nemesis dumps all kinds of exposition about his motives and designs. To make a long speech short, you have a terrible choice to make. Do nothing and you can watch your city vaporized in an instant. Or persuade your innocent sidekick to push a button and send the very massive and morally ambiguous anti-hero trapped in the bow of the fortress hurtling towards the deadly bomb. Naturally, because this anti-hero is so massive, he will impact the bomb with enough force to open a wormhole that will consume the explosion and carry it away safely to an alternate dimension. But you are a noble hero, sworn never to take a life. And that's to say nothing of the scars it would inflict on your sidekick if he pushed that button and internalized the blame of sending the anti-hero to his death. If you do nothing, the city will be nothing but a smoldering memory. But the only way to save the city is to violate your heroic vow and compromise your sidekick in the process. What would you decide? Now, maybe it's obvious, or maybe it's not, but in any case, it's a situation that asks you to decide which is worth more, your heroic integrity and principles, or the practical welfare of the city. Is it worth sacrificing one to save millions, even if it means losing the trust of those millions? Is it just a matter of numbers, or is there something more to this? We could go back and forth on this issue, but the point is that there isn't just one correct, obvious answer, and we run into situations like this all the time. We come up against issues that are complex and conflicted, and then we have limited amounts of time to solve them. And these are the kinds of problems that rhetoric is especially good at solving. And that's because you can't solve a problem like this with science. I mean, what are you going to do? Find 200 superheroes, put them in different experimental groups, and then run a series of tests with statistical analysis to decide whether or not dropping the anti-hero is worth it? Obviously not. I mean, not only is that impractical, but the clock is ticking now. And you can't just put a numerical value on your heroic integrity and then run some calculations to weigh it against the welfare of the city. We like to think that data and formulas can tell us what to do, but the reality is they just can't. So if you're invested in the rhetorical process, you'll take a step back and look at both sides of this dilemma, and you'll probably spend what little time you have talking over the alternatives with your sidekick in order to weigh the alternatives and their consequences against each other. Is your sidekick willing to live with the guilt of dropping the anti-hero? Are you both willing to live with tarnished reputations? Or are you willing to spend the rest of your days patrolling an interdimensional crater? See, this is where rhetoric begins to bridge the gap between our ideals and reality. In a perfect world, there would be a perfect solution to every problem, but the solutions that we come up with are most often the best we can do in any given scenario, not the perfection that we could imagine. So rhetoric is not about how we wish things were, it's about dealing with things as they really are. So after talking it out with your sidekick, you've come to your decision and you have some good reasons to support your position. You're now on the same page and you know what needs to happen. But what would happen if, instead of being trapped up there with your sidekick, you were trapped with the anti-hero's criminal girlfriend? Could you use all the same reasons to get her on the same page? What would it take for her to drop her significant other in order to save the city? Or what if it were the mayor of the city? He might drop the anti-hero without a second thought. But what if sacrificing the city were really the best decision? How would you get him on the same page? Or what would you say to your grandmother? Or maybe you're trapped with an alternate reality version of yourself. If you decide to save your city by dropping the anti-hero, the wormhole will carry the explosion away, but to an alternate reality version of the city. Then the decision is really about which version of the city you choose to destroy and which to save. How would you work that out and make sure that you were both on the same page? You definitely couldn't tell alternate you the same story you would tell your grandmother, could you? Which city deserves to be saved more? So the fact that each scenario would call for a different kind of debate with different priorities and values at play highlights the fact that rhetoric is always context specific. You can't sit in a room by yourself and do rhetoric. It always involves other people and the real world, even if the best you can do is imagine the people who will read or watch what you create. I've said it before, but it's like when I was taking physics in high school. I always thought it was strange that we had to solve problems that didn't have friction or gravity, as if we could just ignore those forces in order to make the math easier. And you just can't bracket things like that when you're doing rhetoric. Even if we're living in a simulation and everything is an illusion, 
the practical reality is that we still need to figure out what to have for lunch and what policies to vote for in the next election. So rhetoric doesn't, and in fact can't, work in a vacuum. Rhetoric bridges the gap between ideals and reality, it connects us across differences, and it helps us to solve the problems of everyday life. And that's why I think it's pretty neato. Okay, so where does this all leave us? Well first, rhetoric is the stuff we do to get people on the same page, whether that means persuading them to take a particular action, to hold a particular attitude, or to adopt a specific belief. Second, rhetoric doesn't happen when people are already on the same page, but it is a useful and necessary tool whenever there's a chance for disagreement or diverging interpretations of facts. And third, rhetoric involves paying close attention to the real-world contexts that you're in and adapting the way that you write or speak in order to fit the situation. And these are things that have their most obvious and common application in things like persuasive papers, but they're not just limited to that. So sure, if you have a good understanding of a rhetorical situation, you can persuade the members of your city council to change a city ordinance. But at the same time, if you have a really good understanding of what the readers of fantasy novels care about and look for in the books that they read, you can craft your own writing more deliberately in order to meet your readers' expectations. So rhetoric is an art as much as it is a field of study, and no matter what I'm writing, rhetoric forms the foundation for everything that I think about when I work. So stick around for more rhetorical fun to come, or take a look at some of the previous conversations that we've had. Whatever it is you're hoping to write, I'm confident that you'll find something to help you take your skills even one step further. As we finish our time together now, thanks as always for watching, and have a delightful week. Here, Kaput, have a trophy. Here, Kaput, have another trophy.